Um, just briefly repeating what we talked about last week, if you were here, we are studying the names of Christ. And of course, we're familiar with John chapter 15, and it starts with verse 1. I'm going to read that. It says, Jesus, the true vine, I am the true vine, and my father uh, is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that doesn't produce fruit and prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been uh, pruned uh, for greater faithfulness uh, by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit uh, if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful apart from me. Really, we can leave it just right there. Um, that is um, actually a reminder, a warning, a support, and a help to us to know that if we want to be fruitful, the only way how we can do that is to remain connected to the true vine. I find that interesting how it says the true vine, because I guess we can be connected to other things, you know? I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, philosophies out there that, especially today, that we can choose from, but Jesus says, I am the true vine and stay connected to me in order to uh, bear fruit. And he even said how they received this fruit. They received it by um, the teaching that he had given them. He says, you've already been pruned. Did you notice that? You've already been pruned by the message that I've delivered to you. And um, so that's uh, what happens to us. Uh, it's through the message, through the word of God, um, that our lives are being transformed and changed. You said you changed the, uh -huh. yeah, lights on, there. Um, you know, um, the meaning was we said that Jesus is our source uh, of life. Hmm? There, no. There. And Jesus is our connection to the source of life. As God, he has life in himself. Having become a man, he extends that life to all who believe or who want that. And then today we're going to start out with talking about the way, which we saw on that bookmark. Um, I didn't uh, actually quote the entire uh, section, but um, we are going to talk about the way, the truth, and the life. All of us need to know the way. Pilate asked, what is truth? Remember that? And then, um, and we all want life. Life is natural. Life is what God has given us, and we want to uh, live it in a uh, pleasing way unto him. So let's go and uh, look up John 14, 6. And somebody else can look up Acts 9, 2. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Mm -hmm. No one gets to the Father but through me. Yeah. So... I like how uh, he actually changed it. He said, um, means the same thing, I'm the road, you know? It's, you know, and the, the, the really cool thing is when you read a different translation is it might, because um, where was that that we read that? Um, no, actually it was in preparation for my Sunday message. Um, you know how Jesus is saying that don't let familiarity breed contempt. And that's what can happen when we're too familiar with something, because we've heard this scripture 1,500 times, you know, and we've heard 20 messages on it, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But what does that actually mean? Um, well, that means that if we want to not be lost and not get lost in this world, we need to walk on that path, on that road, on that way. And then um, uh, we're all in search for the truth um, every day. Now, this is talking in general terms, that he is truth, period. And that involves everything. And then um, that he is who gives life. Um, and we all know that life is more than just um, eating and drinking and sleeping and getting about and doing uh, a work and, and all those things. Life is um, having the peace of God in our hearts and uh, being in, um, in communion with him so that we know how to live life. Um, years ago, my mother said that her pastor uh, mentioned in a message, message once that it's a real art to know how to live life. And she remembered that. You know, go ahead. Maybe you mean to, I can see why sometimes it's hard when you're not in presence. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's <laughs> lent, yeah. Everything we have here on earth is just lent to us. Yeah. So that's very good, yes. Every breath, that is true. Um, so uh, when you read that, the way, the truth, and the life, what does it mean to you? Truth will set you free. Truth will set you free, that's right. So, um, I don't know, the doctor says, um, you have to lose weight. I go to another doctor. You go to another doctor. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, I'm not, I, and I didn't mean you. <laughs> I just meant in general terms. All right. The doctor says we need to lose weight, right? And um, the truth is that um, he knows better, right? And that he is going to help us to get that accomplished. And um, so we work at it. So that's one truth. What other truth uh, do we need to hear sometimes and we don't want to hear it? How we are. How we react to things. Mm -hmm. Especially when they happen. Not just when they're a physical thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you hear that at home sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, if we always find fault in other people, but w and we always think it's someone else's fault, then, you know, the truth might be, you know, take some inventory uh, about yourself. That's right. Okay. What else? When we read the way, the truth, and the life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so... Mm -hmm. That the way is provided, that the truth is there, that he is life. That is true. We do take, I think, yeah, definitely. And we have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Everything to gain and nothing to lose. That's right. Uh, yeah. But why are we then so reluctant if, that, if we know that? Why are we sometimes so reluctant to, to trust that way and to trust that truth and to trust that life if we know it? Everybody who comes this way is not easy. Mm -hmm. yeah. The pressures of this world. And what do they look like? What do they look like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Entitlement, yeah, that's a big one. I think so. Disrespect for those in authority. Uh huh. Total disrespect for those in authority. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Say that again. Including the dear Lord. Including the dear Lord. Yeah. Somebody was telling me this. Uh, that they're trying to take out uh, the reference uh, uh, to God out of the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Is that, is that it? Well, yeah, I'm aware, but is there a new push for it or something really that's more? Because they want to use God in the first place. Mm-hmm. Taking, taking all references to spiritual subjects out of the Hebrew scriptures. Mm-hmm. Well, I know that the ACLU has really pushed for that for many years, you know, American Civil Liberties Union, is that's what it's called, right? Um, 
so I, yeah, I just, uh, when somebody said this to me the other day, I thought, oh, there must be something new going on that I didn't hear, hear of yet, but yeah, I know it's been going on for years, yeah. And not to talk about the fact that it's not going to be possible anyway. You know, it's like you can't accommodate everybody. You know, it's it's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Way over there, yeah. So I guess one thing since we started out our meeting today is to pray, you know, and it does say in the book of Romans that we should be praying for those in authority. So we do need to pray for the president. We need to pray for Congress and the Senate and all those people that are in charge because, um, you know, I mean, for whatever it's worth, uh, you know, they're there and there's a purpose for them being there and we you have to pray. I mean, these elections are coming up. They're going to be huge. It's going to matter greatly who's going to be the next leader of this country and how we're going to be represented or, uh, you know, uh, around the world. And so I think um, I agree that oftentimes we just, you know, step back and we think that the Christian way to be is to never open our mouth, you know, and to never raise our voice. Um, but thank God there are many different ways, especially these days, where you can make your voice count and where you can make a difference. And voting is certainly one of them. Um, Dr. Ben Carson, as you know, has left the race, but my wife was telling me that he's part now of a group that encourages believers to go out and vote because it's been proven in the last election that only a very small percentage of believers actually do go and vote. So, you know, I mean, um, he's no longer in that race, but he's in a different race now, you know, that is just as important and, you know, How long, uh, maybe about a couple years ago, there was a movie that came out on his life. Have you ever seen that one? Yeah, yeah. Very good. I saw that long before I knew anything about mm -hmm. it. On, uh, yeah, I saw that too. Yeah. So, you know, to pray for the government is really important. And then um, to, um, to raise our voice wherever we can. And there are some great organizations out there that um, will help you accomplish that, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, we have so much going in this country in the positive way. I mean, just the fact that we have so many churches in this town that we can choose from, you know, is a proof that there is liberty and freedom, but they're also a threat, and we need to be careful. Right, and it's very true. Mm -hmm. We pray for everybody. We pray for our president, but we want them fired up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, <laughs> all right, we pray for our enemies, but we want them far away. Yes, okay. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's amazing how, um, uh, talking about Joy FM, you said you were listening to it and you heard the movie being advertised. One of the speakers yesterday on radio was uh, telling the story about how she has a friend that goes out and ministers to these um, hippies that live out in the woods. Any of you heard that here on the radio yesterday? It was really amazing, and she said that, um, so they have this group of, a church group that goes out there and ministers to them and, you know, prays with them, you know, they have church meetings there, and so they really reach out to these hippies, and she didn't say where it was at or whatever. To make a long story short, she said that they lived in this separate camp, and then there was this church camp, and, you know, if they wanted to come over, they did, and 
the observation that her girlfriend made uh, with her church was that the ones that were the darkest were most drawn to the church, to this church group. What's that? More receptive. But our observation would be, oh, no, not them, you know. But yet they were the most drawn to it. And, well, anyway, to make a long story short, um, there was all kinds of stuff going on there, and uh, it wasn't an easy ministry. But this one young lady, actually, they prayed with her. She gave her life to the Lord. And um, I thought this was really cool. I mean, whatever we think of it. But she, once she accepted the Lord, started singing in this most beautiful voice, this woman. And the church group thought, well, she must have some sort of church background that she knows these songs and that she's, well, the beautiful voice, you know, I mean, that can be, you know, just period, just a gift. But anyway, it, 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 it turns out that she never had any church background, but that the Spirit of God helped her to sing those songs, you know. And to me, I don't know, that was just an encouragement to think that, you know, we give up on people that, that we deem out there or or, you know, whatever we want to call it. Uh, and, but yet God makes no distinction, and he can reach anybody, and he wants to use the church to do so. You know, I mean, talk about, you know, Doug just said a moment ago, it's not easy to get out of your comfort zone. Talk about getting out of your comfort zone, going into, you know, in the middle of the woods, ministering to people who you don't even know how they're going to respond to you, right? I mean, that's, that's a risk you take. And um, think of... Over the centuries, how many missionaries have gone to the mission field not at all knowing what they were going to face? A big, a big leap of faith, yeah. What was that guy's name uh, who was on Time magazine in the 50s? Oh, gosh. He went to this tribe in, in South America, and they got all killed. I'm sure you remember that. Uh, um, Livingston, maybe? or No, 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 no. Um, what was his name? His wife, oh, I know it. Um, I remembered him by uh, Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was his name, and his wife wrote a book it was called Gates of Splendor. And she writes in this book about what it was like. And these guys, I mean, they went to aviation school and they uh, flew, it was in the Amazon somewhere. They flew out there and they landed the plane wherever there was uh, by this river, there was an opportunity for them to land. And uh, they basically um, started singing their songs, you know, of Christ. and. Um, slowly these, these tribes people would come and they would learn their language and they were able to minister to them and win the tribe over or at least they, they were planting seeds. Well, to make a long story short, because of a, um, of a misunderstanding, they got killed. Uh, there was something that the tribes people didn't understand and so they killed them. But the wives remained and started to ministering to them and won over the entire tribe. For Christ. And out of that, they made a movie called The End of Despair that came out a few years back. I remember with our church, we went up north and we saw it. And um, so maybe in the future we can watch that. Um, but it's an amazing story. And that book um, by uh, Jim Elliott's wife, Elizabeth Elliott, called uh, Gates of Splendor, talks about all that, how they dedicated their lives to win uh, and uh, and how, how the, the children of these people that uh, were the perpetrators that murdered the missionaries, how they became followers of Christ. And, oh, it's an amazing story, really amazing story. And when we're talking mission work, we cannot imagine the sacrifices that have been brought um, by many people um, to spread the gospel. During the war, she and her husband would go to the island in Vietnam, but the children were on another island to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean missionary children? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were also serving as a missionary in that area to serve the Lord. That's right. That's right. They would typically be, which that's a tough one, they would be in boarding schools very early on, yeah? All right. So let's go to the next one, Acts 9-2.
Mm -hmm. So um, the reason why we read that scripture is because the followers of Christ were called people of the way. All right. And uh, why? Because he said he is the way. So that uh, was the first distinguishing uh, name that they had, um, that they were followers of Christ. So Jesus is our path to God. Um, and by the way, ever, anytime you hear somebody say, well, there are many ways to God, it's not true. It's not true. If I take that, that Jesus said, he just said it, and Doug read it, or whoever it was, I am the way, the truth, and the life, or I am the road, the truth, and the life, and nobody kept go, comes to the Father except through me. So he said it. And if he said it, then um, I can't even claim to say I understand all that, but I can say that if he said it, then I'm going to trust it. Then I'm going to believe it. And I'm going to, you know, just say, okay, Lord, uh, you have chosen it that way, and that's good enough for me. So Jesus is our path to God. And he, there, are, there are not many ways. There's one way. Jesus is the way to God. He's the path to truth and life. No mere human teacher. So, you know, because you will have people that will acknowledge, yeah, Jesus was great. He was a good teacher. He was, you know, a person of influence. He was a person who could do miracles. He was close to God. That all does not say he is the son of God. That's different. You know, so leaving it short of what he is is not good enough. He is the map, the road, the destination, and the one who has gone ahead of us. Try to figure that one out, <laughs> right? So he, he, everything is, is summarized in him. All right, so let's go back to uh, the related titles. Hebrews 6. 20. Hebrews 620. <laughs> okay. So, forerunner means you're going through a jungle and you need somebody to clear the path. And what do they have? What's that thing called? Machete? Yeah, and they clear the path for you. So he is the one going ahead. Or if you have a, a, um, a safari, and uh, way back um, um, when they didn't have vehicles and didn't have all the transportation that we have today, or even if they did have vehicles, there were parts that they could only go if they had somebody, a safari guide, who would go ahead and clear the path or show them which way to go. And that's kind of how we have to picture this, that Jesus was the forerunner. He went ahead, and he has provided now entrance for us into this holy of holies that uh, Hebrews is talking about. Um, you know, he um, shows us the example, and he goes ahead, makes the way for us. The verse before, mm -hmm. 16-18, we have this hope as sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. That's right, a high priest forever. You know, because even in Israel's history, um, a high priest, um, it actually even says when Jesus lived on this earth and when he was going through, um, what, five trials that he had to go through, the different trials that he went through, there was a high priest. And I think it was Annas at that time. Well, when he was gone, then somebody else became the high priest. And here it says a forever high priest, okay? Genesis 28, 12. Let's look that up. And somebody else, John 1, 51, please. Okay. So um, here uh, Jacob has a vision, a vision of what God is uh, doing, that God is ministering to us. And that's what we were trying to relate to our children on Sunday, that 
how cool you can have breakfast with Jesus, <laughs> right? That he is so personal that, that it's, there's a relationship there um, that we are um, uh, being reminded of so often, just like the disciples had to be reminded of, okay? John 1.51. Have it read it, please. Okay. So, um, you know, we find that in the Old Testament, like with Jacob's ladder, and then in the New Testament, that God will give us glimpses into his glory. Cindy said a moment ago that we don't give glory to God for this fact that he's the way, the truth, and the life, or maybe not often enough or not consciously enough. And so these glimpses that God gives us into his truth are meant to strengthen our faith and to strengthen us in our resolve to really share it with others because this is something that needs to be shared with other people. We just have to learn how to do that. You know, and um, um, you've maybe heard this example that if a homeless person gets a piece of bread from someone, then they're going to go to another homeless person and say, hey, I have a source. I have received this bread, and they've given it to me, um, and I was able to you know, fill my belly that day, and I, I'm not hungry now. Come on, I'll show you where it's at. Well, it's kind of like that with the gospel. It, that's worthwhile to share with someone else to say, look what God has done for me, and you share it with the person, and it's up to the Holy Spirit to show you how to do that or how to be effective in it. Because I tell you what, it's, um, there is no, because each person is different, we have to be so sensitive of how to get that accomplished. I think that it's just a question. Some mm -hmm. say that the only thing that can make it is mm -hmm. God. That is true. And that is true. Mm -hmm. I think it can be a quiet little smile. Sometimes it's just a smile, she said. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And that can be an open door for uh, building a relationship with someone and and uh, um, being able to maybe eventually also in words share. Yeah. All right. Wisdom of God. How many of you here need wisdom? Yeah. We are his children and we don't know it all. Mm -hmm. We are his children and we don't know it all. When you see the word wisdom, what comes to your mind? What? What? Say that again. Solomon. Solomon. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Good one. <laughs> yeah, we need Larry back there, not just to do all that technical stuff, but to give us his input. Very good, absolutely. He wrote the book of Proverbs, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just that one day he sat down and said, oh, I'm going to be wise and I'm going to share my wisdom with someone, but he learned, and boy, did he learn the hard way. But he is known for wisdom, why? Because when God said to him, ask for whatever you want, what did he say? He asked for wisdom, and he said, help me to be these people's king, All right? That's what he wanted. He wanted wisdom from God. And God said, because that's what you asked for, I'll give you the rest too. It almost sounds like a fairy tale, right, in a way. <laughs> All right. So um, what else comes to your mind when you think about wisdom? Is wisdom the same as being intelligent? No, not at all, actually. Mm -hmm. Wisdom, this kind of wisdom, this godly wisdom, comes obviously comes from God. That's why we're saying wisdom of God. It comes from God. It's not, it doesn't come from studying something. It doesn't come from memorizing something. Well, I mean, it can if you memorize the scripture, if you study the Bible, yes, obviously. But this isn't you know, technical knowledge. Um, you know, there is, I mean, I can know a lot of technical things about the Bible. I could, you know, uh, I don't know, I guess know every, every detail about Paul's missionary journeys and where he went first and when, when did he go back to Corinth and when was he in Rome and all that. I can know all those technical dates, 
but if I don't know the spirit behind the story, that doesn't mean anything. It's not going you know, it's not, it's not to propel me ahead in my faith at all. So um, I have heard stories um, where people were uh, given the task to prove the Bible wrong. In particular, they had this one guy at the University of Moscow that told him, we want you to go in there. This was in the early days of communism in Soviet uh, Russia. And they said, we want you to go in there and prove uh, for us um, as the Communist Party that the Bible is a lie. And so the only Bible that he could have access to was in the university library. So he went and started studying the word of God. And in the process, he became a Christian. <laughs> Figure that one out. Isn't that cool? You know, so God had a bigger plan. And this man was set out to prove that, you know, God doesn't exist and, you know, it's all a lie and it's to, um, you know, to to, you know, prove the non-existence of God and uh, the, the very opposite happened. Mm -hmm. All right, kingdom. Yeah, wisdom, kingdom. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we said it's not the same as intelligence. That is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, kind of what we said, that Solomon, too, had to learn as he went along. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Very good. That's awesome. Thank you for that input. I, uh, that is so true. And boy, those Pharisees just did not let loose. I mean, they were on him all the time. No matter where he went, they criticized everything that he did. And a matter of fact, they always schemed and they always tried to trap him. On one occasion, they said, is it right or wrong to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus knew in his heart that if he was going to say yes, they were going to hate him because they didn't like the Romans. Nobody wanted that. They were an oppressing nation to them, and they lived in, under oppression because of them. But if he said no, then he knew he was an insurrectionist in the eyes of the Romans. So no matter what he was going to say, he wasn't going to win. And what was his answer? The famous answer... That's right, that's right. And that's more than just a biblical verse, isn't it? We use that phrase in everyday language. And in one of our future Reformation Sunday um, services, God willing, we're going to talk about how these things came to be. Many things that we use in our language today are based on uh, Bible translations and discovering um, you know, uh, an English translation for the English-speaking world. So there's uh, some neat history behind that. And this isn't the only one. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. All right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. We sure do. All right, wisdom of God. Bible reference would be 1 Corinthians 1.30, and then the next one, 1 Corinthians 1.24. So let's read 1 Corinthians 1.30, if you have it. But again, I want to go back to what Anne said. It is so important that, yes, the Pharisees were experts in knowing the letter of the law. They knew what the law said, um, but there was no heart and mercy behind it. Okay. He is our wisdom from God. We look at him and we will attain, we will learn the wisdom of God. That's right. 1 Corinthians one twenty four, please. Mm -hmm. Christ, the power of God, and Christ, the wisdom of God. You listen to what Christ is teaching, what he is saying, and... Um, that's why so often the people said when he was done that we have never heard anybody teach like him, right? That, I mean, that keeps repeating itself in the Gospels all the time. And then also the power of God being manifest 
when he healed. I mean, uh, can you imagine somebody who was blind all their life and Jesus, you know, puts uh, his hands on this person's eyes or puts some mud that he created with his spit, right? Remember that? And all of a sudden this person can see. I mean, talk about the power of God being manifest uh, in, um, in the presence of the people that observe that. And, you know, they would have to be like, wow, it's like what just happened here? All right. Um, so he is our wisdom from God. To know Jesus is to be connected to the wisdom of the ages. All right. Um, we say that knowledge is power. Well, um, you want the power of God in your life. You have to know about the ways of God. And we are connected to the very source through Christ. Any questions about that? Mm -hmm. which is the following verse out of Isaiah 44. Mm -hmm. And I love the way this guy writes because it, 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 it connects with me in a way. He who lives in the place of eternity, <laughs> the place of eternity must receive the strength of Messiah. Human strength can't begin to compete with God's weakness. And the weakness is in the location. So when I interpret the map, it's the what is seemingly uh, the greatest thing that a man can do is nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing compared to what God can do. And where his, his weakness is the highest he can ever attain. Mm -hmm. Very true. Very true. And that's why God puts such a big emphasis on humility, too. You know, because humility is is um does not nat naturally come to us and that's that's for uh and we identify it with weakness but that's how christ came into this world i mean you know i mean how much more humble can it be than a little baby in a manger right um like this one christian wrong uh, songwriter says that you know everybody was expecting jesus to come in the main door and he snuck in the back door you know people didn't expect it like that you know, I mean, that's why they went to Herod's palace, too, because they thought, well, surely enough, the king has got to be in the palace, because that's what they were looking for, for the newborn king, right? And Jesus wasn't there. So that's one thing. And you know what? Um, uh, today is the anniversary of Chernobyl. Remember that, when that happened, that terrible disaster? And um, I saw some images of one of the ghost towns there. They have these... Um, what are those uh, electric um, cars, you know, that you have at uh, amusement parks, you know, where the kids can ride them, and um, they're all, you know, there, empty, thrown over in a pile, and, and it's a ghost town. And, uh, and, you know, that was the one big thing in atheism and communism is this arrogance that we, we got this. We know, to how, how we know how to handle knowledge and power and science and all of that. And then when Chernobyl happened, it proved that no, we don't have a handle on it and we don't know how to deal with power. And, um, and, and uh, do, uh, do science and all these things that are so important and given to us, I think, by God to improve people's lives. I mean, how amazing is that, that you have a baby still in the mother's womb and you can do a surgery on the child while it's still in the mother's, while the baby is still in the mother's womb with instruments that are as thick as someone's hair, you know? I mean, that's, that's mind-boggling to, I think, to probably any of us. Have you ever seen that image where um, the baby is still in the mother's womb and the baby reaches for the finger? <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Like holding on to the whoever, the, the physician or whoever that was. And so, I mean, these are no doubt that it's amazing what science has accomplished, but science separated from God is a disaster waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. But we care what God cares. Oh, is that good? Yeah. Without him getting the knowledge, we don't have it. That's right. That's right. And yeah, go ahead. Sarah, because my youngest daughter has different blood types than me, they gave shots to me 
which I wanted because I didn't want them to stick needles in my baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She she was her father's blood type. She was the only one of the six mm -hmm. that was. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. She was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, what you're saying is again that you know that they knew that right that right. The, the the knowledge of these things is wonderful yeah. but at the same time if we separate that from our dependency from god we're in big trouble and that's why you know that's why it's uh, like dave said that's why that's a disaster to waiting to happen if we say we want god out of the picture mm -hmm. because guess what eventually god will say okay then and that's the dangerous part That's right. That's right. Where they say, yeah, I heard the same thing. Like they will say, oh, this patient should not have lived, and then they live. And where they surely say at the patient, oh yeah, they're going to make it, they they don't live. So that 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 dependency of like I like what you said that we care, but God is the one who cures. Very good. The, the doctor said. My husband was going to die. Mm -hmm. There was nothing we could do. Mm -hmm. he, had, he heard a voice say, you will eat and you will get better. And he did. Mm -hmm. So it was an act of God. Yep, absolutely. And that's a, that's a, a what well, we would call that what? A new lease on life, right? We would call that a new lease of life. Uh, and there is an, a, an example in the Bible of a king who, um, who was going to die. And he was, um, he turned, it says he turned towards the wall and he was crying out to God and God listened to his prayer and prolonged his life by I think another 15 years or so. Um, but, but ultimately, and you know, now with Resurrection Sunday coming up and, and you know, thinking about what Christ has accomplished for us, our focus is so much on the here and now and so little on what comes after. And today, or every time we come to church, we're really reminded about our, our eternity and what comes after this, after this life. You said that to him? <laughs> you said that to God, that you can't do this. Yeah, yeah. I can't take care of little ones by myself. Oh, sure. Good, wonderful. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, I've been studying this mm -hmm. in Revelation, and you're supposed to stir up the defilement of the most and then pour. And there's got to be two more stirring up the Holy Ghost. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you wonder what, I mean, people's lives were very difficult back then. I mean, talk about having to be busy. You know, they, um, they typically lived hand to mouth. They had no, uh, no sort of security, uh, when it, what we are familiar with. And so life was really hard. I'm sure they had their distractions in a different way um, because, uh, well, obviously, even Jesus had to do that. You know, like you said, he had to go to a solitary place and dedicate that time towards God. And it seems like this comes up every week, and I know it's for a purpose. You know, it's for a purpose that we need to be reminded that, you know, taking this time away with God is so essential. It is so essential. It, well, I can tell you one thing. It's going to make your life way more productive, way more productive, if you take that time away with him. All right. Um, let's see. We have about another 10 minutes. No, that's okay. So, wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. Well, what comes to your mind when you hear the word counselor? Helper. Helper. Teacher. Teacher. Very good. Mediator. Mediator. All right. <laughs> Mediate between you and your problems, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> oh, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Advisor, very good. 
advisor. Well, I think it is kind of connected to that whole thing with wisdom, don't you think? A counselor does have to have a certain wisdom that we obviously don't, or maybe, maybe we have it, we're just, we just have to tap into it, you know, or be made aware of that it's there. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So patient. Right. All of my experience with counseling has been that they don't tell you anything. What they do is they just say, they listen, and then they ask questions, and then you work it out yourself. Uh-huh. A nurturer, yeah, okay. Well, typically, maybe we go to a counselor hoping for the magic answer, right? Oh, he's going to give me a nicely packaged answer here, and I can walk away this afternoon and say, oh, it's all settled and done. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. But it is a process, isn't it? And so that's, that's very good. You're right. Um, say that again? Mm -hmm. Allows you to internalize and to think about it. Yeah. Now, I do believe, though, and, you know, some people might not agree with this, um, but, uh, and I, I, as a matter of fact, I know for sure that uh, people in the church don't agree with that, but I do believe that for us as Christians, it's essential that we have a Christian counselor. Because there are many ways how people will think that you can find a way out of your problems that are ungodly, you know? And um, so you do, I do think you do have to have somebody who's rooted in the word and who has that that drive to find the answer from, from God. So a Christian counselor, I think, is essential. So wonderful counselor. Well, that definitely, um, you know, well, before we go on, when you, okay, so we, we focused on the word counselor. Now let's focus on wonderful counselor. Wonderful about Jesus. So what's so wonderful about Jesus? And how does he counsel us? Because we're talking about this is the name of Christ. All right, so he's a wonderful counselor. Why is he wonderful? Why is he a wonderful counselor, and how does he counsel? Okay, so uh, in general terms, he's set apart from the rest. Okay. How does he counsel us? Mm -hmm. When he's being questioned by Pilate, and he says, are you a king? Mm -hmm. And Jesus doesn't say yes or no, he says, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, again, this is, you know, I, I go back to the same thing. Back when, when I said that, I read from uh, that, that, that verse that said that the, the greatest knowledge of man is God's wisdom. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that is uh, just, uh, it's hard to comprehend, hard to understand, and it's hard for us as mere mortals to condense it. You know, you really have to think about, uh, boy, he, he said a lot of things in, in his life that weren't quite evident. I mean, there's, I was listening to Jesus Christ Superstar 
Mm-hmm. And they're referring to the uh, the followers of Jesus who are, you know, blindly following him. And he's the Pharisees, and they've been looking at how many miles of crackers in the street. And they, they disparage them, and they say, these guys don't know what they're talking about. They don't even do this. Mm-hmm. And they just don't get how great and what the nature of Jesus' power on them. You're talking to disciples now? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Well, going back to Peter, great revelation. You are the son of God. You know, we're leaving everything. We're following you. And next thing you know, he's denying him. So this willingness to learn, but this inability to comprehend, you know. So, um, well, I mean, I think with Palm Sunday coming up, uh, that's, that's a big turning point because here you have the cheering crowd who is completely nowhere to be found just a few days later. Okay. All right, so um, we're just going to leave it at this wonderful counselor. And um, we are, um, again, I just want to encourage you, don't forget about the movie on Wednesday night. And um, I can promise you, you will walk away encouraged and uh, your faith strengthened. And the same with the following week when we have our guest speaker coming in. All right. Um, anybody here who would like to close us in prayer today? Anybody? Well, Lord God, we um, thank you that uh, we can be together in your house, that this is your house, this is your ministry, and we're just privileged enough and uh, blessed enough to be part of it. We uh, ask that as we go from this place and as you have ministered to us and as you have counseled us, probably in more ways than we are aware of, um, that it would take root in our lives. We pray for those um, that are displaced and refugees around the world um, that don't have a home to go to and do not know what tomorrow will bring, that you will help them and that you will help those that are helping. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.